Thank you for joining today's webinar, Understanding Pregnancy Diseases. My name is Jody Rizzo O'Brien and I'm part of the Sheep Connect SA team. Sheep Connect SA um, is probably supported by Australian Wool Innovation, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, Department of Primary Industries and Regions. If you want more information about Sheep Connect, you can go to our website or you can follow us on Twitter. Today's presenter is Dr. Sean McGrath. Sean graduated from veterinary science in 2010 from Charles Sturt University in Wagga. He spent some time working in Western Victoria and Southern Western Australia before settling back into Millicent. In 2014, he, with his wife, purchased the Millicent Veterinary Clinic from his father. And recently they have purchased the Kingston Veterinary Clinic. Sean is predominantly an animal production vet with a growing focus on working with farmers in an advisory setting to ensure productivity is maximised through on-farm management practices such as animal health programs and feed budget assessments. Sean delivers a variety of farmer extension programs and workshops, including the Sheep Connect Ramping Up Repro um, with AWI, and he also has presented at the recent livestock forums by Red Meat and Wool Growth Program. At this time, I'll hand over to Sean, who will talk to us about pregnancy diseases. Thanks, Sean. All right. Thanks, Jody, and welcome, everyone. Yeah, so tonight um, we're going to talk about understanding pregnancy diseases in sheep. So we'll jump straight into this. First one we'll talk about is pregnancy toxemia. And this is also known as twin lamb disease pretty commonly. When do we see this? And we see this in generally late pregnancy. And what it shows up as what you guys will see on, on farm is down ewes. And so they'll be unable to rise, but they'll be weak in the front legs. Um, and they'll, have, they'll be a bit glassy in the eyes. Now, this video here is of a, um, of a ewe with preg tox, um, actually at, uh, at my folks' place in the shearing shed there. So if you can see here, she's, um, she's obviously with it. She's standing, um, but she hasn't got a lot of energy. She doesn't want to move. She doesn't want to run away. Um, she takes a fair bit of prodding to get things moving. Um, you'll also see she's pretty light on in condition. Um, and so, yeah, this is um, typical of a, um, of a ewe with preg tox, um, even though she is up. But um, yeah, when they're down, they will also have that sort of um, glassy look in their eye um, and just unable to get up. So what is preg tox? Well, essentially, it's, um, it's an energy deficiency and it's all about supply and demand. So in late pregnancy, um, the demands for energy go up. Um, and this is especially exacerbated when there's twins, twins in that ewe or even triplets. So demand's going up, but this also um, can be exacerbated when supply of energy is going down. So this is when there's low feed on offer or the pasture is of poor quality. And sometimes this can be a real issue with um, time of lambing and time of calving. So I think it'd be fair to say that we see more of this problem in autumn calving uh, flocks. And when, um, when foo is low and quality is low, um, whereas the spring, spring lambing ones uh, probably don't have this issue quite as much. So it's real supply and demand. And if we think about what um, energy requirements are happening, we've got uh, ewes here in the last month of pregnancy can range from 14 to 18 ME. Um, and anyone that's done a lifetime ewe course will be aware of this, um, this rise in this last month of pregnancy. And if we equate that to just a kilograms of dry matter, um, on a daily basis, that's um, 1.4 to 1.8 kilos of dry matter uh, required. Now that dry matter requirement to supply the energy is in pastures of good quality. So of 10 to 11 ME, which is really your, um, your good quality sort of late winter, spring, spring pastures. So if you've done a, if you can do a feed budget or a bit of a feed assessment and, um, and you can't, don't have the quality pasture or the amount of pasture, to supply these requirements, then you're going to be at risk of, uh, of preg tox in those ewes. And so if you if you're not got the pasture to, to meet those requirements, obviously you need to start thinking about supplementation. And essentially um, a grain is going to be the best um, bang for your buck as it's an energy dense um, source of supplementation and, and uh, the sheep can eat a, um, a reasonable amount of that safely and get a lot of energy. But um, what I wanted to point out was just some hay requirements because that uh, is quite often or can be used as another alternative. The important column here is the one on the left. So for pregnant ewes, and we're talking about the quality of the hay here. So this is looking at some, um, some feed testing um, parameters. And so we really want an ME above 9.5. 
And if we go down to the third row, we want an NDF, which is less than 55. And those two are, are quite important because it means that the, the sheep can intake that amount of, uh, of hay or high amounts of hay because uh, the NDF is low. The, a high NDF will limit the intake. And the, the ME also needs to be over that 9.5 so that um, we've got enough energy going into the system. So I guess the key point out of this slide is to, if you're going to feed hay um, or even silage, make sure you get some feed tests done um, and look for these sort of parameters. And, and I think these parameters, are, you know, be quite similar for a silage. I do see um, um, some pretty ordinary feed tests out there for silages and, and silages that are actually probably worse than some hay. So if you don't have grain, access to grain or um, the ability to feed grain and you, and you're stuck with hay or silage, make sure you get some feed tests done. So what, are, what can you do for pregnancy toxemia? So if you've got down, down ewes or even those ones that we saw in the video, we can, do, we can use these, what, these three, a combination of these three treatments. So there's the CETON, which is on the top right picture, which is an oral energy supplement, which is specific for ruminants. Um, and that's, that's the pink drench, which some people might have had experience with. The other brand name for that is Ketol. We've got Vitrate Liquid Concentrate, which is down the bottom left. Um, and that helps the rumen to absorb the, the Ceton. And we also like to use these um, four-in-one pouches, which has got a bit of glucose in it, but also has uh, some calcium and magnesium, which we'll touch on in a bit in terms of um, low calcium. But I think that uh, that is often goes hand in hand with pregnancy toxemia. And so the combination of these three products um, will help get those ewes that are down, get them up, or those ewes that are looking a bit glassy in the eyes and a bit doughy, um, stop them from going down and tipping right over the edge. So in terms of prevention, essentially prevention is just feed. And so, you know, getting your feed budgeting right and getting the feed right for the animals. Like I said before, it's a, it's a simple supply and demand. If there's not enough good quality feed, um, to match the requirements, then we need to think about supplementary feeding. And if we're going to supplementary feed, we need to get it right. Quite often, uh, you know, people don't have a good handle on how much they need to feed or how much they even are feeding. And so if you're going to supplementary feed, do some feed budgets, get some advice and, uh, and get it right. And the other thing to think about is body condition score targets. So Ensuring that um, ewes are in an appropriate condition score coming into lambing will help prevent some of the problems of pregnancy toxemia. Uh, we know that once body condition score in ewes drops below two, mortality rates um, go up very quickly. And ensuring they're in the right condition score, which generally is around three to three and a half, depending on if they're single or twin, is important. And so just a little plug for the Lifetime U program. So if you haven't done a um, Lifetime U course, they will teach you these sort of basic uh, tools, which um, is some feed budgeting and, and body condition scoring. So the next uh, disease we'll talk about is uh, hypocalcemia. Um, this was also known as milk fever. And essentially it's low, low, it's low blood calcium. And how do we tell this in sheep? Well, um, we'll show some videos in a minute. They, um, they look a little bit different to the pregnancy toxemia, but if we put a four in one treatment um, under the skin, they will generally get up and run away. Um, obviously some, uh, some blood tests for the calcium, uh, if we've got an access to a vet, will help diagnose the problem. And they, once again, they will also present generally as down use. And so it can be a bit tricky to tell between um, hypocalcemia and pregnancy toxemia. But I guess the, like I said before, in the treatment of preg tox, uh, I think they go hand in hand a little bit. And so hypocalcemia is at the highest risk of it happening is in older breeding ewes and also in extended periods of grain feeding. And um, we'll, we'll chat a little bit more about that as we go along. So these are some photos from a bit of a bit of an outbreak we had at the property. Um, these ewes had been uh, mustered in for landmarking and held around the yards overnight. Uh, and so you can see this one's down and um, not able to get up. We had here, we had, there was quite a few mortalities. So there was a lot of dead ewes strewn around the holding yard um, and a couple of down and looking pretty depressed. And here's a few more, yeah. Bit of a um, bit of a war zone it was, it was sheep down everywhere. What happens in hy hypocalcemia in the last trimester of gestation? Um, we get this big draw of calcium uh, from the ewes' bones going into the fetus. So as the fetus starts to make its own bones, 
uh, the calcium gets sucked out of the ewe and into the fetus. And, um, and what we see typically is um, we can see some outbreaks like that last one, and they generally with down ewes. And it's usually around a handling event. So um, quite often a you know, pre-lambing crutch or pre-lambing um, vaccinations and drenches. Sometimes we see it combined with pregtox, as I mentioned before. So this video here um, is a bit of a close-up of one of these down sheep, down ewes, and hopefully you can see there's um, just some fine muscle tremors and fasciculations. Um, a little bit different to the other one with the pregtox where um, the sheep was just a bit uh, doughy on it. This one's got these fine muscle fasciculations, and uh, that's the low calcium that sort of um, meaning the muscles can't work properly. This ewe here, another, um, another one affected in the same problem. Um, she's a bit more lively than the pregtox one we had before, but her movements are a bit jerky. And so hopefully you can see with her back legs there, they just lift up a little bit quickly. Um, and she's just a bit uncontrolled in her movements, whereas she's still quite um, lively and bright um, as compared to that pregnancy toxemia ewe. So the main risk factors for, um, for hypocalcemia is um, the main one really is grain feeding for extended periods of time. So, um, so anything over six weeks would be, you know, considered extended and a bit of a risk. And the reason for that is, is that grains are inherently low in calcium. And so for that long period of time, the, the intake of calcium through the, through the diet is just diminished. The other risk factor is old ewes. So older than five year old are a higher risk factor. And this actually uh, is a bit compounding. So if we have a few years upon years of, of ewes having to be grain fed for long periods of time and short, um, short growing seasons, the problem can compound and they never quite replenish their, um, their reserves in their bones. And so that's why these older ewes are at a higher risk. The other risk is, uh, is twin bearing ewes, um, simply because the, uh, the, the drain of the calcium going into the fetuses is, is, is greater because there's two of them there. And the other big risk is, is stress. And like I said, handling. So handling in that last four weeks um, coming into lambing um, is a big risk factor. Um, and being off feed during handling for greater than 12 hours, I've certainly had a few cases where we guys have um, brought them in for pre-lambing treatments and left them in holding yards overnight and then had problems the next day. So being off feed for that extended period of time is also a risk factor. And just at the bottom of the slide there, there's a few other um, sort of secondary risk factors. And that's around to do with um, soil pHs, um, phosphorus, phosphorus levels in soils, and then extremes in feed on offer and extremes in body condition scores. So these other things also play a part, but, but the main risk factors are those four at the top. So grain feeding, old use, twin bearers and, and handlings. So how can we uh, prevent, prevent hypocalcemia? So um, it should, uh, there's supplementation available, but it uh, should really be targeted. And so anything that's on grain pre-lambing for, you know, over that six week period should have some supplementation added. Um, and the other one that uh, sometimes can pop up is in lactating ewes on grazing cereals or irrigated ryegrass. Um, and once again, these two um, forages are just inherently low in, in calcium and the grazing cereals are a classic one where, um, where lactating ewes can, um, can drop dead from, from hypocalcemia because the, the grazing cereal is so low in calcium. And, and so how are you gonna do it? So, um, so there are loose licks obviously available and they're um, proprietary licks um, that you can buy off the shelf um, or you can make your own. Um, so some, some stock lime mixed with salt um, put out into the paddock. Um, or if you're feeding grain, you can just, um, can just apply that stock lime or limestone with the grain at, at a 1% ratio. And so um, as you auger it out, you can pour, lime, pour the limestone in through the auger at that 1%, um, depending on how much you're feeding out. And so that's the best way to, um, those two ways are the best way to get to the calcium into the, into the ewes. And like I said, it should be targeted for those situations where the risks are high. So the next one uh, is vaginal prolapse. So this can be, I'll sort of break it into two, two groups. It can be mild and you can replace it or it can just be catastrophic and, and everything eviscerates. But generally it's pre-lambing. And so pre-lambing. And so we see these um, before lambing, we don't generally see them after lambing. 
So this is a, uh, what we say something's mild, that's sticking out not very far from the, from the back end of the U and that can be replaced and held into place with, um, with the protainer, which I'll show you a photo of in a minute. Whereas this is this um, sort of evisceration where the, uh, the, the, the vagina is prolapsed and there's been a split in the vaginal wall and the intestinal contents eviscerate and there's obviously no coming back from that. The risk factors for vaginal prolapse is essentially it's a, we sort of see it as a fat sheep disease in our area. Um, so anything that's um, body condition score greater than four is at higher risk. Uh, use that are multiple bearing are at higher risk. There's just a lot more intra abdominal weight and pressure. We probably see it mainly in maternal breeds, but that's not exclusive. Um, can happen in uh, merinos. I think there's a bit of a tie up with, with hypocalcemia. So calcium's uh, actually required for uh, good muscle function. And so if we're a little bit low in calcium, the, uh, the strength of the muscles is, uh, is gonna be compromised. Uh, and it's certainly some good evidence around to, um, to show tail length is important in rectal prolapses. And this would go, uh, go for vaginal prolapses too. So. We don't want tail length too short. We'll show you a photo in a sec of how long um, we recommend the tail length to be. But essentially, uh, in terms of treatment, you can replace those mild cases with a, with a protainer, uh, and these are readily available. Um, and I think a four pack's about 15 or $20. There's sort of a T piece, which um, the sort of wider part uh, pushes in and holds the prolapse in place. And then there's some clips there to clip onto the wall of the U. And, um, whilst they're not 100%, um, they will get a few through to lambing and um, you know they're worth a go and worth trying. In terms of tail length, um, the recommendation is generally um, the, the third palpable, palpable joint and um, that generally comes in line with the, with the tip of the vulva in use. So, so when we're marking lambs, we need to start thinking about getting this tail length right. You know, I do know there's a bit of resistance because it makes them harder to crutch. But I think uh, in terms, if you know, we're getting problems with prolapses, uh, that can be a bigger problem in general. So um, ensuring that we get this marking length right of the tails uh, will help prevent some of these problems. So we'll move uh, into abortion in sheep. And um, I guess this is you know, a bit what more people might think about in terms of pregnancy diseases. But and so we split this up into, into a midterm versus a late term abortion. And so the midterms are really um, characterized or seen when we have losses from scanning to marking percentages. And so this is where um, having some measurements and doing some recording comes in and analysis comes into play. So if we know what the scanning percentage was, especially if we're separating singles and twins, you know, if we've got a mob of singles, we know we should get um, you know, 95 or six percent. Um, but if we're if we're marking less than say 90 percent in a single mob, um, and there's no other good cause in terms of a bad weather event, then we need to be suspicious that we've lost some fetuses between scanning and marking. And the same goes for twin bearers. If if we're getting more than 20 percent loss from scanning to marking in those twin mobs. And there's no good cause for uh, lamb deaths that we know of them. There's not you know, a heap of lambs lying dead on the ground, then we need to be suspicious of a midterm abortion event. And then late term abortions, they're a bit easier to pick up because we'll just see fetuses on the ground. Um, the midterm abortions, um, we won't see the fetuses because they are so small. Um, they are sort of, you know, mouse or rat size when they're losing them. So we won't see them, whereas the late terms are, are much more obvious. And so this is a uh, picture of um, of some late term of a late term abortion. Um, so like I say, much more obvious. We've got uh, the lamb over here, the um, the placenta and the afterbirth here, and the ewe was just off to the edge of the photo here. So um, you know that was pretty obvious. Um, this is that same lamb a bit closer up, and you can tell it's a, a premature. Um, it's not quite formed properly. It's a little bit domed in the head and and a little bit. Um, a little bit light on for its coat development. So, so that's a late term abortion. Uh, whereas this is actually a midterm abortion that we managed to find. It's a little bit gruesome, but um, the point here is that it's, you know, it's quite small, you know, that's um, a set of tweezers holding it up. Um, and so you'd be lucky to find that in the paddock. So that's where the, um, the measuring um, and looking at your numbers really comes into it. So what causes these midterm abortions? Um, I guess, you know, to start with, we've probably got a few unknown causes and it's a bit of a, um, a um, 
a lack in the science here, especially in some ewe lambs. We've done some work on a property that had some pretty ordinary ewe lamb results or abortions. It's, you know, we didn't get really get a good answer, but um, we think there might be some a bit of a tie up in the growth and the condition of those ewe lambs as they go through pregnancy. So that's an important thing to monitor and be on top of. The other main ones that we'd see in terms of infectious causes are Campylobacter, which I'm sure people would have heard of. And there's two, two strains of Campylobacter, there's the Jejuni and the fetus. Um, and we probably uh, associate the Jejuni strain with um, causing these midterm abortions more so than the fetus strain. The fetus causes the, the late-term abortion storms. And the risk with the Campylobacter that we see um, and associate is really through grain feeding as this um, increases the fecal transmission of the, of the bacteria. The next uh, infectious cause that we see cause a problem of, term, of midterm abortions is brucellosis. That's something that uh, does pop up and we've have identified from time to time as causing these midterm abortions. In terms of late-term abortions, um, they're mainly bacterial causes. These three are the top ones that we probably culture, that being Listeria, Campylobacter and Salmonella. Listeria is generally uh, associated with sort of waterlogged pastures or um, lots of dead, uh, dead vegetable matter, so around swamps. Campylobacter is a little bit more, um, a bit more varied and salmonella, same thing. It can be a bit more varied, um, probably a bit more in a um, containment feeding scenario. Essentially though, they're all um, diseases of intensity. So when we've got higher stocking densities, um, even whether that's in paddock or containment feeding, um, the risk goes up. And, and this is because these bacteria are um, usually fecal uh, oral transmitted, so they get um, shed through the feces and then uh, ingested uh, while the sheep graze. And so if that um, stocking density is high, that um, transmission is more likely. Um, and also trail feeding as well um, can raise the risk level. Um, and that's due to around that fecal contamination whilst the, whilst the sheep's grazing. So what are we gonna do? So if we get um, some, if we think we've got some midterm abortions, cause we think we've, um, you know, we're not marking enough lambs for what we've scanned. Um, it's a good idea to wet and dry some ewes at lamb marking and work out how many, you know, really true dry ewes we have. Uh, and then we can do some blood tests on those ewes. And, and in the blood tests, we can um, mainly test for um, exposure to the campy um, bacteria. But it's also a good idea to, um, to palpate your rams. Um, and this might help pick, pick up some brucellosis that's been undetected. So that's a starting point for midterms. In terms of late term abortions, and this is, um, you know, when we're getting a real abortion storm and, and you know, we can see anywhere from 30 to 50% of a mob um, lose their lambs in an abortion storm. And so the best thing to do here is to submit some fetuses um, and the placenta. So if we get the placenta, we get a much better chance of, um, of making that diagnosis. And if we can get that to a vet clinic or um, even a PERSA vet and get off to the lab, um, that's a good start. The same as the midterms though. So if we, um, if we wet dry some use at marking, we can do some blood tests and um, once again, uh, have a look for exposure for the Campylobacter. And in terms of um, when the abortion storm is actually happening, um, one of the first things you can do is try and reduce your stocking density as best as possible. So uh, I guess if they're in containment, try to get them out of there um, or even in paddock situations, just try and um, minimize the mob numbers and try and spread them around a bit. To pick up the aborted material and remove that from the paddock is, uh, is, um, is helpful because uh, that aborted material just further contaminates the paddock. Um, but if you're doing that, make sure you wear gloves as um, a lot of these bacteria can be transmissible to people. And this, and this is this the photo of the, um, the afterbirth of the placenta. And so if you're, if you're um, submitting lambs or fetuses in for testing, make sure you grab some of this and bring it in and that'll um, make sure you get a better result. So in terms of prevention, the main thing we probably talk about is uh, with uh, the infectious types. So um, there's vaccination for Campylobacter, that, the Campyvax vaccine. Um, I believe you had, a, um, or uh, Jody ran a webinar recently on this, um, which goes into a bit more detail around the Campylobacter. But one thing I would say is just make sure you prove it first. So we've certainly had the odd case of, um, of farmers having, having bad, identifying some um, bad marking or scanning results and assuming that they had Campylobacter and um, they went to run off and uh, start vaccinating. But 
we suggested we do some um, checking on the brucellosis and we certainly found uh, brucellosis um, right through the RAM team. So Campy might have been playing a role in those losses, no doubt about it, but, um, but brucellosis certainly could have been as well. And so um, just make sure before you go running into a vaccination program that you also address the RAMs for brucellosis. So I think that's an important thing that gets missed. Um, and in terms of you lambs, and uh, infectious diseases, um, one strategy that people can use is to try and run the ewe lambs on lambing paddocks before they're pregnant. And that's to try and get a little bit of exposure um, to some of these uh, bacteria um, before they're actually pregnant where they might have that abortion problem. We'll just sort of finish up here with a quick bit on brucellosis. So whilst we don't always, don't always think of this as a pregnancy disease, as I just sort of mentioned, we, um, we do see it associated with um, those midterm um, abortions, um, and and we see we see brucellosis on I've sort of said one to two properties a year, but it might even be a bit more than that. Um, so it's still pretty pretty common out there, and and we certainly um, we pick it up a lot, and more than I always uh, thought we would um, since it's you know been around forever. And so what does brucellosis do? Well, essentially it. Um, in the ram, it damages the uh, the testes and it damages the plumbing coming out of the testes. So you can see in that photo, the, the testy on the right is a normal testy and it's got normal structures, whereas the one on the left is affected. Um, and the big sort of lump at the bottom is the epididymis, which is, um, you know, three or four or five times the size. And the testy itself is probably um, a bit smaller than it should be. And so, so that testy is not going to be working properly. Um, and so that ram will be subfertile. But what we also see in the flock is, um, it is could be a variety of things. So um, we could have a reduced scanning percentage. So we could have, have had reduced conception rates. Um, if we've got a long, longer lambing time, so, you know, a eight or 10 week joining period, um, the lambing pattern might be a bit spread out. So instead of everything lambing early on, we could have used it ab abort early and then um, get in lamb later in the period. So that lambing pattern is spread out. We might have a reduced marking percentage, reduced, you know, lamb marking percentage than what you might expect normally. If you normally get 120% and you only get 100%, um, you know, maybe ask the question why that is. We get these reduced marking percentages compared to scanning percentages, which we've mentioned a couple of times tonight. So how do we prevent uh, brucellosis? Well, first of all, when you're buying rams, make sure you buy from accredited flocks um, and most, most studs are accredited and uh, they have to go through a, um, an initial accreditation and testing program, which is then followed up by um, biennial testing regimes to prove that they're free of free of OB. So make sure you buy from accredited flocks. On your own farms, um, you can do an, uh, annual pre-joining ram inspections, and so that involves um, going through the ram in general, and you know the 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 four T's, um, you know, teeth, toes, testy and tassel, which is what we talk about in the ramping up repro workshops that um, AWI uh, helped deliver. In terms of OB prevention, if, we, um, if we're doing these annual pre-joining ram inspections and we're focusing on the testes, um, we can palpate those abnormal testes and, and certainly get a blood test out of anything that is suspect. And that's a pretty good way to screen for OB. So we do this a bit on people's places and, um, a few years ago, we had a guy that had been doing it, um, been doing it pretty regularly for four or five years, and um, and we went to do his annual check, and we had about thirty percent of rams were infected, um, which is within a twelve month period. So that was a, a bit of a su surprise and a shock, but we did it far enough out from joining that we could uh, deal with the problem and get stuck in and um, and try and get a replacement ram team and um, try and minimise the losses that with the, the reproductive losses that we see. So if you want to, if you do have it, um, we won't go into the ins and outs of this, but essentially uh, you, you, you will need to try and eradicate it and that's difficult and it's expensive and it involves you know, palpating and blood testing rams every 14 to 30 days and then culling any positives. Another property we had last year, we diagnosed it and after we blood tested the whole lot, the first time around, I think about 60 or 70% of the rams were positive on the blood test. So it was pretty rife through them. And, um, and so the big cost uh, generally in eradication um,
can be just replacing that RAM team. In certain situations, we can sort of stagger that out over a year or two, but eradication is difficult. So best to try and prevent it by, um, by using accredited flocks. So that sort of brings us to the end of all the uh, pregnancy diseases. Um, yeah, so we'll sort of throw it open to uh, any questions. Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Sean. Um, we've got several questions that have been have come in, but as a reminder, if you've got any questions and you haven't yet submitted them, pop them in the Q and A box, or you can pop them in the chat, or if you've got my mobile number, close a hand, you can flick me a text, and we'll um, get to as many questions as time allows. Sean, I'm just wondering whether you could touch on the transmission of brucellosis, we, um, about how it's transmitted between rams and also then to use. Yep. Um, so I guess initially you generally need an infected ram um, and it's, it is a bit of an STD, so, or it is an STD. Um, and so between rams, um, we get sort of homosexual behavior and riding in the ram pen. And so they sort of transmit it uh, amongst themselves there. And then between ewes and, or rams and ewes, um, once again, it's an STD. So a um, infected ram will join a ewe, um, she'll be infected. The ewe will generally clear it after a, um, after a cycle, so, um, or maybe two, but I guess she can then also pass it to another ram if he comes and joins her whilst she's infected. Excellent. Um, we've got another question here about brucellosis. This producer um, does test screening with serological I hope that said that right. Methods yep. is that appropriate for large scale screening? Yes, that's the only testing like screening test we have really. What we sort of tend to do for our commercial guys is, like I said, with those pre joining inspections, so palpate every ram, and we generally um, just blood test those that have uh, lumps in their testes, and we sort of feel that's a pretty good way to screen um, because if uh, if anything's got a lump and it tests positive, um, or it's more likely to test positive on a blood test. And so um, that's a pretty clear diagnosis then. Excellent, thank you. Um, you talked early on about treatments for preg tox. Um, where do you buy those from? Do you need a veterinarian or can you buy them at your local rural supplier? Uh, no, they're all, they're all over the counter. So uh, rural suppliers should uh, have all those products, yeah. Yep. Excellent. Um, and so the, the one that follows on for that is you talked about proteiners. Um, and where do you buy those from? Yeah, once again, uh, your oil suppliers should be able to get them in. Um, so they're a product that come from Shoof, which, you know, make all those sort of, um, or supply all those little bits and pieces and gadgets that most of the rural suppliers have accounts with. Excellent. Okay, so people can um, visit their rural supplier and grab those products. Um, yeah. I guess this is a question from, from me, as well as a lot of our producers, is a common question I get, and um, I think a lot of producers also have is, well, how do I tell, and I'm wondering if you could recap, if I've got preg tox or I've got hypercalcemia? I think it's a common issue with producers about knowing the difference between the two. Can you just, just give us a recap on the two, the differences in how you diagnose those? Yeah, so I guess on farm, it's a, it can be a bit tricky um, to tell between the two without, uh, you know, without blood tests and, and further lab tests. I think one thing you can do if you've got, uh, especially dead ewes, obviously, is, is cut them open and have a look. If there's twins or triples in there, you know, it's probably more of a pregtox issue because their requirements are so high. I think that's the, probably the easiest way on farm to sort of tell. Um, pregtox ewes do have that sort of um, glassy-eyed appearance. So um, you'll sort of see them just sitting there or standing there quite depressed, not wanting to move and just being really glassy in the eyes. But like I was sort of saying, I do think that they tend to go hand in hand a little bit. So I think if you've got one, I still treat for the other because I think, um, yeah, I think you see both of them together a lot of the time. Great. Um, that's all the questions for this evening. Um, thank you to those who joined us for today's webinar. I'd like to thank you all for joining our webinar. Sean, I thank you for sharing your insight and expertise with us. If you've got additional questions um, that you've thought of after the webinar, you can contact us directly via the contact information in your webinar registration. I thank you for your time and have a lovely day. Bye.